next speaker is Sarah Spencer. So Sarah's uh, up from Melbourne. Um, Sarah is a hobbyist maker. Uh, she runs a company called Heart of Pluto uh, with her partner John, who was also uh, at LCA yesterday. Um, and she hacked a knitting machine from the 80s, and she's going to tell you all about that project uh, and how she is now using it as a printer to make her artwork. So over to you, Sarah. Hello. There we go. That's better, isn't it? Thanks, Chris. Great introduction there. Um, right. So she's pretty much covered it all. The Knitting Network Printer. Let's get into it. Um, yeah, as Chris mentioned, I hacked a domestic knitting machine from the 1980s and turned into a network printer. <laughs> That's quite a statement. <laughs> um, hopefully, by the end of this talk, you'll also appreciate, or hopefully, I'll have thoroughly convinced you that it is indeed a knitting network printer and um, I've released all of my source code uh, up on GitHub as well so anyone who's interested in following along with me or, or, or following along what I've done then uh, by all means um, love to love to talk knitting um, all right let's uh, let's take a closer look so the real question here is how do I actually define a knitting network printer because again that's that, that's a, that's a lot to say all by itself so fundamentally the problems that, uh, that I wanted to solve here was um, it can accept an image from my computer. That's kind of, kind of important. Over the network, especially, also kind of important, knitting network printer. Um, I especially wanted one that uh, could accept more than two colors in any single row. So fundamentally, I wanted a, a printer that could print more than just black and white. I wanted multicolor. And um, it needed to be able to do it hands-free. So in my mind, a printer is not something that you, know, you have to sit there and, and, and work at uh, for hours in order to finish the, the actual um, produce. But I'm going to caveat that with uh, mostly, <laughs> because this is a machine from the 1980s. There's a lot of uh, uh, um, details to actually producing a knit. But um, I like to think that I got it mostly hands-free. But again, lo love to hear your thoughts on, uh, on how you think I went. Um, so in order to achieve these various things, I had to hack it in multiple ways. Um, it, it isn't just one, one hack defeats them all. It's, I approach this problem from a lot of different angles. So um, today I'm going to be covering um, the software. So it's mostly Python, mostly Python with a little bit of PHP and JavaScript as well. Um, and I also need to point out here, I'm not a Python programmer. And uh, I was a PHP programmer for, but from a previous life. So I apologize in advance for any code that you, that you, that you may see. Um, I'm also going to be covering some of the hardware. So this is mostly an Arduino hack um, with a little bit of uh, Raspberry Pi. Um, it, the Raspberry Pi is, uh, is the network part. And uh, I'm also going to be covering some things I've printed. So what's the point in a knitting network printer without actually making stuff or, or, or producing actual knits? So, um, I, uh, I'm a software engineer by trade, so um, I like to pr you know, produce uh, uh, algorithms that I can then go ahead and knit. So a lot of that has been done using processing, so I'll also be sharing some of my processing code with you as well. All right. Standing on giants. So I'm definitely not the first person to, uh, to approach this particular problem or, or to hack an eating machine, so to speak. Um, but there are a lot of people who have been working in this space and some really amazing projects that are out there already. Um, so I just wanted to uh, yeah, give you a, a brief introduction to the giants who are already out, out there in the world. Um, before I move any further, who here has actually seen uh, a domestic knitting machine? A few people, yeah? Okay, I'm going I'm to count roughly uh, 15 or so-ish. Um, and is that in real life? You've seen a, a domestic knitting machine in real life? Yeah, okay, about, yeah, about 10, yeah, or oh, about eight-ish, roughly, yep. Very cool. So not very many, I want to point out, um, in, in this group. So it, they're actually really old machines. They stopped producing them back in the 90s. Um, they, they don't make them anymore because people just stopped using them. It's, it's so cheap and easy. Just go down to your local store and, uh, and, and buy um, you know, a scarf or, or a jumper. So the market changed um, and the people changed. So yeah, you can't even get a, a newer knitting machine now. So the only ones available are really from uh, the latest from the, from the 1990s. So for those people who haven't actually seen a domestic knitting machine, um, the, fundamentally they are 
uh, very similar to commercial machines, but obviously commercial machines have gone above and beyond what the domestic range could actually do. But this is, what, this is essentially what it looks like. Um, so you've got your yarn uh, sitting on the table and the yarn goes through a yarn feeder. It's, uh, the yarn feeder is really simple. It, 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 its primary job here is to uh, make sure that the, the tension on the yarn is consistent as you um, pass the carriage across a bed of needles. Um, so the main difference between knitting needles and a knitting machine is that um, on old school knitting needles, you have all of your knits all on two needles and you pass from one needle to the next. But on a knitting machine, there's one needle per knit. Um, so you have a bed of, of, of needles and each one holds an independent knit. And the carriage will actually perform the, the knit as it, as it passes the, uh, the yarn across, across the bed. And I've tried to find a, a nice gift there for you, a zoom in version of each of those needles um, as, the yarn, as, a, sorry, as the carriage passes across the yarn bed. Um, it actually performs the action on the needles to perform the knits. Um, and it can do this really quickly because um, uh, the needles actually perform the knits in, in, in multiple succession. So it isn't one after another, it's actually a fluid motion. Um, and of course the knitting is produced and it uh, comes down underneath the knitting machine um, usually held down by weights because you don't want your knitting to kind of bulk up around the needles and get caught up. So it's held down by weights. So basically all the domestic knitting machines, and there's quite a, different, a, a few different brands, but fundamentally this is kind of how they all work. And um, here we have uh, a video of the lovely Lorna Watt um, demonstrating for us how knitting machines were originally designed to be used. So um, even from the very early knitting machines, uh, you can use this technique that she's using here, which is um, called intagia knitting, to produce um, uh, two colours in, in a single row, or, or even more than two colours. Intagia is considered uh, the picture knitting technique, but um, the main thing I want to point out here is, uh, as amazing as this work is by Lorna, it's really hands-on. Uh, using a knitting machine is considered a handcraft because you have to sit there and it's a lot of hard work. Uh, to produce knitting on a knitting machine. I mean, it's, it's, it's easier than needles. It makes some things easier, but in other ways, it makes other things a great deal more complicated. So, I wanted to automate this. How crazy am I? <laughs> um, just a really quick uh, history on the Brother range specifically. So, my, my knitting machine is a, is a Brother 950i, and uh, this is kind of all the, the um, knitting machines in the range. It was first released in 1955 uh, with the KH uh, 500 to 700 range. Purely mechanical machine, basically the same as the ones I've just shown you, um, uh, that, you that Lorna was using and also the image. Um, it, it's, it's essentially just a, a carriage and a bed of needles, and you drag the carriage across the needle bed, and that's about as complicated as the actual mechanics get. But then in the uh, 1970s, they added a punch card system. And what the punch card does is where Lorna was hand-selecting those, those colours and, and, and defining which colours were going to be on each of those needles, the punch card does a selection for you. So you just have to do that a little bit easier. Um, and then in the 1980s, um, they released, the, uh, or the brother specifically, uh, uh, company released the K900 series, which was also electronic. And instead of a punch card system, it was a scanner. So you could just get a sheet, essentially a sheet of plastic, um, fill in your dots, scan into the machine, and, uh, and then the machine will actually hold that pattern for you. Um, and you can go back and, uh, and knit it whenever you like. So, a little bit of history repeating. Uh, 2007, um, there was uh, uh, the first inkling of, of hacking these knitting machines that, that, I, that I'm aware of. Um, the, uh, the survey hack for um, the, a mechanical and punch card machine. So that was um, uh, Gelsomnia, if I'm pronouncing that right, Gelsomnia. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, then 2010, KH900 series, the Adafruit Python hack, which is, which is one I use, super exciting, love it. Um, 2013 plus, KH900 series, the uh, AYAB Shield. So that's using an Arduino unit to essentially replace um, the smarts of an electronic knitting, knitting machine. Um, really, really cool hack. Um, if, you're, if, you, if you purchase an electronic knitting machine with um, the brains are, are essentially dead, the onboard circuits don't, don't actually work, then you can just replace them with an Arduino unit now, which is really awesome. I personally don't use it because um, the computer on my uh, 950i is fully functional. So w when, it, when it dies, and I'm sure eventually it will die, uh, then that's uh, the AYAB shield is an option. I think AYAB actually stands for all, 
All yarns are beautiful, so it's an acronym. <laughs> so there you go. Um, and last year, Knitterate. I don't, did anyone see the Knitterate project up on Kickstarter? So massive, yeah, such a cool machine. Um, that's essentially priced kind of in the domestic range, like con conceivably within the domestic range. And it's a tabletop machine that will do all the knitting for you without any uh, sort of hands-on operations at all. So knit rate, very, very cool. Wish I could afford one. Um, okay, so there, this is the ser servo hack that I mentioned. Um, essentially, uh, a, a pair of, um, of students in, in Germany uh, um, Magdalena and Hannah put together this project where they essentially got a, a bank of servos and you can see them, the silver server sitting there um, and they're uh, in line directly manipulating the punch card system. So if you can think of a punch card system where, uh, where there's a hole in, in the sheet, the, the, the finger for the um, punch card is, is up and where there, there isn't a hole then it's down. So these servos are manipulating the punch card system directly. Um, which is really, really cool. Uh, and I believe they used a Arduino to, um, to, to uh, uh, activate these servos and basically do their own pattern knitting. Um, yeah, really awesome system. I couldn't find much information about it. I, personally, I love the idea because um, the punch card knitting machines are so cheap now because they're, they're really old tech. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I actually picked one up in an op shop for $10. Um, so this is, you know, that, that's the sort of tech we're, we're working with here, and the idea that we can turn turn that around and make that new again with a, with a stack of servers is actually kind of, kind of exciting to me. So, wish I could find out more information about this. Um, so the one I'm using is uh, was originally written for um, the KM930, um, the, the 930 Ninja machine. Uh, so this was released by um, the, the actual source code for it was written by uh, Steve. Conklin and Limor Frieda, um, but of uh, Lady Adder um, fame. Um, the way this hack actually works is uh, the uh, electronic knitting machines have an FTGI port um, where you were, uh, the, the original intention was you, you scan in your, your knitting pattern into the machine using the Mylar sheet scanner. It stores the pattern uh, data files on the knitting machine and then you can back up those files onto a floppy drive or a PDD device. So the idea being that if you can save the files, you can also recover them again from, from, a, from a floppy disk. Um, so why, why is a, an original floppy disk from the 1980s, why not just talk directly to that FTDI port and upload and download files directly to the knitting machine? So that was the original intent here that, um, and yeah, when I was looking through the source code, I was really impressed by Steve seemed to uh, have produced a floppy drive emulator just to talk to this knitting machine and um, very, very, very cool stuff. And this is all written in Python, by the way. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much more detail, but essentially you're, you're talking to, the idea is to talk to the knitting machine via a, um, a, a floppy drive emulator. Um, also, these knitting machines didn't really ever use um, a nice, happy format for the FTGI cable, so you actually have to hack the cable as well, but all the instructions are up on the uh, Adafruit website under ElectroNet, um, so I'm not going to go into too much more detail, but yeah, FTGI cable hacking is surprisingly hard because you have to reverse the polarity of the cable and there's, a, there's like an old Windows script from Windows 95 that you can use, but it, anyway, it's a little bit of fun all by itself. <laughs> um, so I mentioned that I've got a 950i. Um, I was actually, when I, when I first got into this, I was actually living and working in London and, um, and I, I thought this, this knitting machine hack was brilliant. I need to get my hands on knitting machine. And, um, and I just stumbled across this piece of information in the London Hackspace wiki where they're like, yep, yeah, documented. We've got a knitting machine. It's in this location uh, doing this with these maintainers. And I'm like, oh my god, there's a knitting machine at the London Hackspace. I, um, I jumped on the, onto their, uh, their IRC chat and, and bless their souls. I, I was a little fangirl coming up on their IRC chat saying, oh my god, you've got a knitting machine. I need this in my life. And, um, and they said, yeah, okay, come on in, which is awesome. So I hacked their 950i. Um, here you can see a successful running of, uh, of the Adafruit hack. I actually, I had to modify it, and it took me a little while to figure this one out, but um, fundamentally the difference between the 930 and the 950, I thought the numbers, you know, they're super close, 30 and 50, so it can't be that hard, but um, <laughs> turns out the 930 is a 16-bit machine and the 950 is a 32-bit machine. <laughs> I figured it out in the end, so I've got a, uh, got a fork of that, of, uh, that code here. Um, right, so, can accept an image from my computer. 
going to call that a check? I'm going to call that a check. OK, over the network. So we've got an I-50i. We've hacked it to accept images from a computer. But it's not over the network yet. Let's fix that. I love this kid. He's so cute. He's like, oh. Um, who here has heard of Octoprint? Yeah? Yeah, a few of you. I'm going to say about eight, roughly. Um, Octoprint is a web interface um, uh, which has been made for 3D printing devices specifically. So um, I personally haven't used it, but, the, but the, I, I really like the idea <laughs> um, where you can up, upload your um, 3D print files essentially into um, a, a queue and manages the print queue. And you can also change, you can preview your files and you can change some of the parameters for the printing before it goes into, into print. I thought that was brilliant. So I thought, well, now I need an Octonit in my life. Um, so this is a piece of uh, a website that I built. Um, at the time, I think this is circa 2015 now, I wanted to learn PHP Zen 2. So that's why it's written in PHP Zen 2. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so um, what, I, what I really wanted out of this mostly was to be able to preview my files um, in addition to um, just being able to send, uh, to keep a store of my, uh, my needing patterns and be able to send it to the needing machine. So, <laughs> I'm going to attempt the live demo gods. This is going to be fun. Here we have Octonet. I've done a lot of penguins lately, so you might notice. Um, right, so have it. we'll take a closer look as to uh, what knitting actually looks like. Look at that. <laughs> Jiggle the cable. Oh, no. On the laptop. Wow, that's, that's an amazing knitting pattern. I've never seen that before. Oh, no. That's kind of fixed, sort of. Oh. I wonder if it's because of what it's actually showing. If I go back. See, that's fine. There you go. This might be a really quick demo. Uh, all right. So, sorry, guys. <laughs> The main thing I want to point out here is that you don't you can use you can still use images and here I've got a little tux. And you can drag it onto the knitting pattern. Hopefully this fixes it because there we go, it's slightly more stable. <laughs> Thank you, tux. <laughs> um, and what I especially want to point out was um, knitting isn't quite pixel shaped. It's actually kind of more, you know, of a rectangular kind of shape. So you see here tux is a little bit short and shorter and fatter than what he normally looks like in, uh, when you put him into a knitting pattern. Um, yeah, so it's that, that ability to preview that I was particularly keen on. Talks. Save that. All right. <laughs> you can just see his feet, the important parts. Right, so now that I can save and preview my um, knitting pattern, I just want to go ahead and knit it. So this will actually use the underlying, uh, the original eight of, well, sorry, my fork of the Adafruit hack uh, to perform the actual actions to upload to the knitting machine. Um, and I, this is about as far as I'm, as I'm, I'm going to be able to show you because I don't have my knitting machine with me. Sorry. It's back in Melbourne. I do have a lot of videos, though, so stay tuned. Hold on. Uh, now, how did I? Aha, full screen. OK, so that was Octonet. This is where OctoKnit lives today, on a Raspberry Pi connected to my actual knitting machine. So now it, it, my computer itself is uh, not connected to the knitting machine anymore because I can just um, I can work on my images as, as much as I like on my actual computer. And then when I'm ready to preview, I can just pop it into OctoKnit, see the preview knit, and OctoKnit can actually do the sending to um, the knitting machine for me. So, sorry for Raspberry Pi and modern technology. There's a source code over the network. Check. Um, I, I do want to stress that uh, it is written in, in PHP Zen Framework 2. Uh, a little bit long in the tooth now. And it's a little bit buggy. So, oh, and, and my husband tells me that it is notoriously difficult to install. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I, I do actually want to completely rewrite Octonit. I, um, some of the JavaScript side of things with the HTML5 canvas and being able to manipulate the nits directly and being able to upload uh, or just drop images in, that sort of stuff I'll probably hold on to. But um, yeah, the underlying bare bones of Octonet, oh, I've, I've been waiting for a free weekend to 
rewrite. But there's the code if you're really interested in having a look. Right. Not just black and white. So cute. Um, going back in time again, I'm going to say circa 2015 roughly. Um, I was running knitting machine classes at the London Hack Space for a little while. Um, and that's mo mostly as, a, as a, you know, a, a thank you for letting me come and hack your knitting machine. So you know, teach everyone else how to come and hack a knitting machine. Um, so these are just some demo pieces, uh, two color demo pieces that I made. Um, a bit hard to see actually, but never mind. Um, uh, for um, the London Hackspace uh, classes I was running. So the thing about knitting and knitting in two color or knitting in multicolor uh, is that you have to show the back of the work because the back of the work is what tells you how how it looks and, and whether it's even you know whether it's even something that you that you want to reproduce. So the fronts of, of these particular the, these four techniques all look very very similar. Backs, on the other hand, that's a, that's a wildly different story, that one. Um, so you can see here in Tagia, which, um, yeah, which I, I showed you a video of Lorna doing earlier. Um, very much hands-on, you know, a lot of hand manipulation. Same with, um, uh, essentially, the, the, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but to get feral to work in picture knitting, to get feral to look good in, in patterns that have more than four knits in, in, in a single colour, um, you have to do a lot of manipulation to get the floats um, to, to work back into the knitting. So I found Ferrol, um, in terms of automating this, Ferrol didn't really work for me and Intage didn't really work for me. But the really cool thing here was double jacquard. Now double jacquard is double layered knitting, um, which by itself is pretty fun. Essentially it knits both layers at the same time, um, back and forth, back and forth, and it's the pattern on the back that's holding together all the knitting in the front. Um, and what I really liked about it was the actual action to produce double jacquard is that, left to right, left to right, no hand manipulation going on here. So, I have a video of that. I'll take that back, it isn't just left to right, it's left to right and button pressing. <laughs> left to right and button pressing. So double jacquard, because it's a, it's a double layer technique, you actually need two um, uh, two beds of needles. So you've got the top bed of, of the full 200 needle set and then you have a second bed uh, called the ribber um, underneath to perform the, the knitting on the back. So you've got twice as many needles to deal with and it's not notorious for um, messing up because the needles are significantly closer together because it's going back to front, back to front where, where the, the ribber bed is actually offset. Um, uh, but uh, it works, and, and I, I quite like, yeah, essentially in terms of uh, automating this, it was the, the, the simple actions of left to right and the button pressing that, uh, that, uh, that really appealed to me. But um, the knee machine is getting bigger, you'll notice. It is more than twice as big as it was before. Even more reason not to bring it to Lena's Conf. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> um, okay, so this is still two color at this stage. Where, where's, uh, you know, where's our multicolor work at? So I was looking through um, the instruction manual that came with my um, Brother 950i, and I found that the Brother 950i and also the 930, and I believe the, 9, the 910 as well, they already supported multicolor, but it seemed that no one else was, was doing this multicolor multi work. So I, um, I, I, I printed out a, a, just a, a standard pattern that was already available on the knitting machine. Um, and I noticed when I was, um, when I was knitting out this, uh, this multicolor piece, the knitting machine itself was telling me which color to switch to. And I'm not sure if you can see it. Oh, yes, yes, it's quite easy to see. The numbers down the left-hand side on the original pattern card, it's showing one, repeating one, two, one, three, one, three, four. So those are the integers that say which color to switch to in, in the actual color changer that you saw in the, uh, on the left-hand side in the previous video. So the knitting machine knows which colour I'm supposed to be changing to uh, in, in a multicolour pattern. But the Adafruit, ha Adafruit hack didn't. There's nothing about the Adafruit hack that, that's even hinted that it could support a colour integer in addition to, um, to the actual knitting in the row. So I, I looked into this in, in more detail. So I, I did a what I, what I like to refer to as a deep dive into uh, how the, um, the file formats were being produced by the Adafruit hack. 
Um, and I did make some interesting uh, discoveries. So, I've, so I found that essentially when, um, when it stores the, uh, the patterns uh, in, in the file, it has a header space uh, for the, um, yeah, the header information. It's got the pattern information. And in the header, there's a few um, uh, features I had to reverse engineer. And just by simple trial and error, I found um, being able to customize the width and the height of my, of my knitting. So originally, um, uh, the, the hack only supported um, 60 needles wide and 150 rows tall knitting because that's the size of a mylar sheet. Um, so you'd scan, so you just have a mylar sheet and that's what you could upload to the knitting machine. But in the header data, you, you can set a custom width and a custom height. So I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Um, and, uh, and I also found some, uh, somewhere in the header to turn off the mylar sheet scanner too. So um, as, you're, as you're knitting a pattern, it would normally just assume that you've got the mylar sheet in the scanner so you can follow along on the mylar sheet as, yeah, and, and it would feed through as you finish a row and it would you know, feed the actual, so you could see as you're going. I turned that off because that was really annoying. Um, and then I made a rather delightful discovery, major epiphany, very exciting moment, 2015. There's a giant white blank space in the header where we can store information, but we're not actually storing anything at all. And it's always the same height as the number of rows in the knitting. Always the same height. What could that be useful for? <laughs> the color integer, of course. So there's this comment that I'm pretty sure was left by Steve Conklin. So shout out to Steve out there. <laughs> I figured it out. <laughs> Major, major moment. Very exciting. So here we go. I modified um, the, the, the hack. Um, and again, this is, this is up on my, my fork of the hack. It only supports 950i. But I mean, if you look through the, the code comments and just uh, and, and, uh, and, you know, reverse the, the single commit I made on, on the 950, you can get it to um, work on the 930 as well. But um, yeah, now uh, you can take a multicolor image. So instead of just being a, a one-bit bitmap, this is now a multicolor PNG. You can upload that to the, um, uh, or you can convert that into uh, the knitting files. And in this example, you can just about see the color integer down the side and saying whether to knit that color or not knit that, that, that color in ones and zeros. And then the output of the knitting, multicolor. So pretty, isn't it? Who doesn't love penguins? <laughs> But this isn't good enough. There are four nits to, for each pixel, and I only want one nit for each pixel. It was about this stage that, uh, I think this is circa 2016 now. I'd moved back from London, back to Melbourne. I'd, I'd gotten married, and I had my kid. And this is actually pretty accurate to what my life looked like at that stage. <laughs> A lot of crying babies. When... Um, when I was on maternity leave, I found that I was spending a, a, a very, very long hours doing, uh, being physically exhausted. But I, was, I didn't have anything to do with my mind. Like my, I needed some kind of mental stimulation. So this is what I pondered over. How to get four nits down to one nit per pixel. And at this stage, the, the knitting machine guide was no help to me whatsoever. No one had previously done this. It, any actual pattern, um, and I might actually switch back and show you that in detail, the, the actual patterns available in the knitting machine always had double height. So um, it, it always, because the color, the color changer was on the left side and then there's no subsequent color changer on the right, in order to knit multicolor, you have to go all the way up from left to right and, and you know, if maybe you've got the color red in your, in, your, in your carriage. In order to come back to the color change, you have to return. So all the patterns in the, um, that, that I, could, I could find um, in the actual... Um, set of documentations and anything that any, anyone else had done online always doubled the height of, of the patterns. So in order for me to get the pixel shape, um, I took the double height and I also made a double width to get pixel shape. So this, was, this, is, what any, uh, this is about as far as anyone had actually gotten at this stage. So I thought about it. Did a lot of time to think. My hands were full, I couldn't do any coding, but I spent a lot of time thinking. I had a few solutions, <laughs> just a few. I'm not going to go into too much detail here because fundamentally it's, uh, it's about understanding how many rows you're knitting into the back of the work versus how many rows you're knitting to the front. If you do a pass where you knit in the back but not knit in the front, it's actually making the front longer. A bit hard to explain, but um, I'll just show you what it came up with. <laughs> Single knit per pixel. 
So we, um, the very far uh, left penguin you can see here is the original um, uh, four nits per pixel. And then uh, my, what I referred to as my offset theory, uh, which ended up being slightly taller, and um, because the more, the more passes you make without knitting into the front, but you are knitting into the back, it actually elongates the front in order to make a nice flat, a nice flat piece. Um, then the blank second pass, which obviously adds more um, yarn into the back rather than the front, and the dithered, which is trying to offset that. But fundamentally, we've got one knit per pixel. No one had done this before with the domestic knitting machine range. None, none of them, not even to the latest versions in the, um, uh, in the 1990s. And um, when I, uh, again, I updated my, my code and I, I released it onto GitHub and, and I made a big blog post and I shared it out with the knitting machine community. Um, most people were a bit confused by it. <laughs> I actually got one piece of feedback from, from a crowd who, uh, who run uh, commercial software or, or who service commercial software for these older knitting machines. And um, the, the main feedback from them I got was, uh, oh, that's interesting. It doesn't work though. It's not possible. Like, I've, I've done it. Here it is, right here. It's, <laughs> It's on GitHub. I mean, anyway, so that, that's been done. I was super proud of that one as well. Um, and of course, because uh, because I'm a machine knitter, I always show the back of my work. Here are the backs. It's all done in double jacquard using um, uh, a, a three color technique. And also a comment on four color. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the, the theory of the offset row method that, uh, that I came up with, it does sort of kind of work in full color, mostly. Um, the main problem with this, of course, is that the elongation problem is extended because you're using more colors, therefore more yarn is going into the back than it's going into the front. Um, and I mean, it, it looks okay, but uh, if, you, if anyone wants to come up and have a, have a closer look at these, uh, these knits later on, um, it actually feels a little bit like cardboard because there's a lot of knitting all kind of smooshed into, into a very small space. So it doesn't feel nice as a product, although it looks okay. So there you go. That's what Gizmo had to say about that. So updated my source code, of course. So can I have more than two colors in any single row? I'm going to call that a check, yeah. Hands-free, mostly. You may notice there's a lot of babies in this, uh, in this set of slides. Um, right, so I mentioned earlier that um, using double jacquard, I essentially have two main, two main behaviors here, or two main things I want to automate, which is the left and right, left and right, and the button pressing. The first one is actually really easy, and to be honest, I did actually hold off for a long time on doing this. I, I just went out and bought a motor, which you know you could buy with the brother range. They're notoriously expensive, um, and fortunately, I've sold enough knitting that I could afford it, so that's nice. Uh, hobbies that pay for themselves are always lovely. Um, but that took care of my left and right motions. I did actually want to make one myself, to be perfectly honest, but um, you know, I've got a toddler, so no need to reinvent the wheel. Now, this next piece um, is actually pretty awesome. Uh, I went and uh, and asked my husband, hey, do you think you could you know, automate this button pressing for me? And he said, no, nah, it can't be done. Um, <laughs> came back to me a few days later, he's like, oh, no, actually it can. Uh, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail because um, uh, my husband is uh, John Spencer from uh, uh, the Open Hardware Minicomp fame, and I do believe he actually talked about this uh, yesterday on Monday. Um, so, uh, uh, he, I, I, I couldn't do it justice, to be honest. But it is essentially uh, Arduino-compatible uh, custom board that, that he, he, he designed. Um, so I can actually go in and change the code and, up, and upload a new set of source code if I want to change. So I, always, I always knit in the same sequence in terms of color changing. I always go one, two, one, two, one, two. Or in three color, it's one, two, three, one, two, three. Four color is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Anyway, I haven't changed my techniques, but if I wanted to, I could you know, modify the source. Uh, really nice thing about this GitHub uh, auto changer um, uh, uh, repo that John has created for us is that um, if you wanted to uh, look at the source code, you can look at the source code. It's also got instructions on how to build it, which is nice. So he's, uh, he's gone that extra mile there. Uh, the other nice thing about the color changer I, I just want to mention is that it doesn't actually talk to the knitting machine onboard computer. So in theory, it'll work for older machines, not just the 900 series. It'll work for the 
800 series and any, any other knitting machine that, uh, that can su support um, a color changer arm. So let's put it all together. So it's automated mostly. I still need to cast on and cast off. So there's a little, yeah. <laughs> I know, right? I'm working on it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I can actually walk. <laughs> I can actually walk away. Um, you know, once it, once it's, it's started knitting. Unfortunately, I do have to come back again every hundred rows or so to move the the weights the, the the weights that are holding the knitting underneath the machine. I do have to come back and adjust those every hundred rows or so, roughly. But I can walk away from it, and that was kind of my goal for an automatic uh, 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 knitting network printer. Um, I actually did this video on Sunday, and um, rather typically in, in the last minute fashion. And um, the, the, the knitting worked beautifully. It was completely flawless. But uh, the camera cut out on me in the last 100 rows. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so at some point, this video is actually going to stop any minute now. And you just have to trust me that I did actually finish that, uh, that, this particular piece. Uh, it, it finished fine. Uh, the casting off process is actually very, very similar to the casting on. So if you can just you know, imagine that just reversed and stuck on the, yeah, anyway. Uh, and this is what I was actually knitting. So this is just one of my... Oh, you can't really see that very well, can you? It's, um, it's a rocket scarf. Um, right. Oh, actually, before I go on. So, can it hands-free? Mostly? Are we going to call that a check? Yeah. yeah, let's call it a check. All right. Checkity check. All right. So what's the point in a, uh, in a knitting printer if you don't do anything with it? So... I love kids. <laughs> so what have I printed? Um, yeah, a, a few things, just, um, just a handful of things here and there. Um, I get a lot of commission uh, requests, which I absolutely love. Uh, they're really good fun. Um, I think the two that I particularly want to point out here is the Hamilton blanket. The texture there is so much fun. To, I really enjoyed that. And also the uh, literally to it turning... Uh, uh, um, so a pair of faces of my friends into a blanket was good fun too. Um, so I'm still limited by the three, three, maximum three colours per row, but I, I've actually found a lot of fun with that particular limitation, so that's kind of why I haven't done the four colour yet, because I'm still having fun with three colour. Um, but there are a few particular pieces I wanted to um, sort of give you an opportunity to have a slightly deeper view on, um, and that's to start off with some binary scarves. So, yeah, shout out to Chris Howard's talk on knitting is code. So this is my code that I've turned into knitting. Um, so I've uh, uh, released that onto, oh no, I haven't. I, I will release my binary to image um, script, which is written in processing, and because my knitting machine accepts images, I, uh, and I find processing to be really, actually, I have to admit, I originally wrote this script in Bash, and it was really slow at converting binary into, into, uh, into an image, so I rewrote in processing, and now it's super fast. Um, yeah, so here we have uh, uh, um, the uh, Lovey virus from, I think, 2001 era, so I've managed to find that source code um, and turn it into a scarf, so it's the I Love You Virus scarf, and, uh, and uh, essentially it was a source code turned into ASCII characters, turned into binary, and then converted from that binary into four colours. So. It's, it, the, would you believe that the original virus was actually too big to fit onto a scarf? So there's actually two scarves. <laughs> it's because I love you, and it's like two scarves. So yeah, <laughs> worked out well. Um, and the nice thing about ASCII characters is you can pretty much convert any bit of text into into binary and map it to four colors or two colors or what have you. So there's there's another scarf I made, which is just you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. So I'll stop singing. Um, Geelong Scarf Festival 2017, that was good fun. Was... <laughs> they do that every year. <laughs> uh, and uh, the 2017 theme was galaxies, which is so awesome. Uh, so I had two entries. Um, one of them was the entire Milky Way knitted into a scarf. Um, no source code for that because I actually did that by hand. So I basically got a photo of the Milky Way and I sort of hand selected which stars I wanted to appear and because, because all the stars have different luminosity and it would have taken me forever to write a script that you know, looked at all the different luminosities and mapped them properly. And then I've also converted the space dust into a, to a different colour integer. Um, I did want to um, make one point though that uh, 
that there in the very center, the largest celestial body in this gulf, it's Jupiter. Um, so the other piece was uh, Tessellator rockets, MC Escher style. Um, that one won an award, actually. That was pretty cool, the uh, Tessellator rockets. That's good fun. Uh, Request of the Grown Trees. Um, now this, I'm not, I'm not going to release this code because it's awful, quite frankly. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's essentially just a, a recursive pattern that goes through and, and changes the widths of the branches as it goes. Um, and the, part of the reason why it's awful is because the, uh, um, the angle on the branches is, is, uh, doesn't really honor the width of a scarf. So most of the time when you run this script, it's and and all over the shop and it won't actually fit onto a scarf nicely. So you have to run it a lot of times in order to get it to look good on the scarf. But um, yeah, these are recursively grown trees. Um, Hans Meinhardt, theoretical biologist, um, he did uh, a body of work on um, coming up with a really cool mathematical algorithm to, um, to reproduce uh, uh, this, this uh, pattern that you see here on, on the back of a, of a tropical sea, sea snail. Um, the problem, and I absolutely love this pattern, I thought this was brilliant, um, but the problem that I had was that uh, well, Hans Meinhardt actually passed away. Um, he, I couldn't understand his maths, and the, uh, the program that he wrote uh, to synthesize, um, the, 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 to produce a, um, an example of, of the actual uh, pattern, was written in Visual Basic 6. I couldn't even get that to work properly on, on a Windows XP emulator. Uh, so, so we're talking really old school here, so I, I actually... Um, uh, converted line by line the Visual Basic script from, from the original version into a processing script, which I've, I've released on GitHub as well. Um, I also added a seed so that if you come up with, with a really lovely pattern, you can actually get back to it because you've, you know what seed was used to generate it, which is, which is good fun. Um, and I'm not 100% sure that it's working as it's supposed to, but it looks right. If someone knows maths better than I do, it would be good to get that confirmed. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I turned that into a knitting pattern as well. Oh, um, I've actually got a lot more detail on this particular one up on, up on the blog because I wrote a blog post about this as well, uh, if, you, if you're interested. Um, and cellular automata. Uh, I have to uh, give a shout out to Fabine from, uh, from Nityak because, um, yeah, she, she does these. She's actually got a commercial, well, she, um, uh, she did a Kickstarter and she managed to um, make enough money to get herself a commercial knitting machine, which is super awesome. So. Um, yeah, her, her commercial knitting machine can do way higher resolution than mine can because it's uh, using a lot finer yarn. Um, yeah, so she does some really awesome cellular automata. Uh, I don't think she really works with 150 though, so that's kind of where the space that I've been looking at because it's, it's fun. Um, but for anyone who's not familiar with cellular automata, essentially it's just a, um, a, a mathematical equation that dictates the, um, the each, each row in the knitting is based on, is essentially the children of the previous row. Um, so uh, using a different rule set, so depending on what rules, it produces different off offspring from the previous row, which gives you a different pattern. So it's a growth pattern. It's, uh, it's supposed to be emulating a cellular growth pattern, uh, which is good fun. Thanks. Uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> questions? We have a few moments for questions. Ah. G'day. That is really, really cool stuff. And I'm, oh, uh, my sort of first question was, where do we, you know, are there forums selling knitting machines? Or you know, are they easy to find still? Or are they scarce as hen's teeth? Price on eBay is going up every time. <laughs> yeah, <you're> sorry. <laughs> I think this, this uh, w once, uh, once this talk goes up on, uh, um, on YouTube, the price might go up again. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, so the, nine, the 950i was released in Australia, the 930 wasn't. So you can get uh, refurbed machines of the 950i for quite a high price point though. Um, I, I was really lucky when I found my 950i. I was, um, I, mean, I was living in London at the time. I was watching eBay and, um, and I actually saw someone post up a 950i uh, up on eBay with, but with no photos and very little information and I thought well this could be a scam or it could be a, you know, someone's genuine attempt to upload their old knitting machine. Um, so I waited for it to, um, to, to finish and then I got in a direct contact with them and I said, hey, can I have a look at it? 
and yeah, it was just a, um, an older lady who was trying to sell her knitting machine. Um, and I got a really good price for it when I, when I told her what I was wanting to do with it at the London Hack Space and, and um, to help to teach other people. So it, sometimes you can get lucky. And actually, there's a, a, a knitting machine magazine um, that sometimes lists up things up for sale. And I believe there's also a machine knitting um, enthusiast group uh, in, in Australia that um, often will have members post up their equipment. So eBay is not the only resource. Um, there, there's other other ways to get a hold of these new machines. Cool. Yeah. There is a guild in South Wales. Guild, so that's Victoria, the one. Yeah, but there is, yeah, there's there's there is actually. I've, I've met some members of the guild in Victoria, so there's there's definitely some around. Yeah. There's one, uh, the Spinners, Weavers and Dyers group in Queensland, and I know there's one in the ACT as well. Fantastic. Um, the other, I. Cool. Yeah. The, yeah, has that being another brand. The other yeah. one, the other question that I had regarding four colour knitting. You're talking about the problem of having to do the reverse pass, uh, but that's with all of your colours on one side. Yep. Can you put two colours on one side, two colours on the other, and swap them? I'd love to. <laughs> Want to help me out? <laughs> I work on it. <laughs> yeah. So, the, so interestingly, the the main problem with actually um, hacking the the colour changer was um, the arm itself that's holding the colour changer. It's it's. Uh, a very specific shape in order to, for, to get around the um, the, the carriage, um, and it's also uh, uh, yeah very specific point, very specific shape. Um, uh, I haven't actually been able to reproduce that actual arm, but you're absolutely right. If we had a color change on both sides, then we should be able to just swap colors um, either side, and then the, the fundamental problem wouldn't wouldn't uh, exist. We had to keep returning. Yeah, ex exactly, and it'll be a lot more. It'll be a lo yeah, multicolor knitting. It'll be a lot more efficient. We wouldn't have to do so many passes in the back in order to get stuff in the front. You're absolutely right. Um, I've been wanting to put a color change on the right hand side forever. It was never released by um, by brother, I'm, which I'm really quite surprised by. I would have thought that you know by just reversing all of their patterns, they could make you know a left hand uh, color changer and a right hand color changer, and they'd make more money. But they never released one. There you go. Hi, that was a great talk. Oh, thank you. Um, the Mechanical um, Brothers, that's the, I think it's the 830 or thereabouts, yep. the, with the punch card, yep. um, it looked to me as though it would be straightforward to put something which was either inserted or not inserted in a little array to replace that punch card. Do you know of anyone that's done that? I know you were talking about that German one, mm. but that looked like a slightly different model and that looked like it required more stuff. Yep, yep. So that, so th that stuff was essentially um, a whole bank of servos being um, inserted in, into the existing punch card system. So I, I don't see any reason why I can't just pull out the punch card system altogether, excuse me, and then um, and connect it up to um, the other hardware pieces into like onto something like another Arduino unit um, directly uh, and get that to talk to the, to the hardware. Um, I, I really wish I had more more time on my I, hands. Well, I, maybe like, I should pull mine apart and have a look. Yeah, absolutely, do it. I, like, absolutely. I, I, I've got a punch card uh, uh, brother myself. I think it's like it could actually be the 830 as well, or it could be the. the let's talk after this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, for people who want to note, um, the clubs in Australia is um, Macknit, M-A-C-K-N-I-T, and then the various clubs in the various places usually have. Um, well, the New South Wales ones would be members of Magnet. There it is. Amazing. There, there it is. Um, the important thing about those guys is that members get cheaper machines. <laughs> <laughs> and occasionally you yeah, can get it, some yeah. good yeah. bargains. Yeah, the, the, the members are a lot nicer to each other, so they're willing to you know, not charge an arm and a leg for them. All right, I think that's tea for now. Um, thank you again very much to Sarah.